So by show of hands, who's done code generation in the past in Elixir or any other programming language? I can barely see, but I do see a few hands going up. Who's used the code generation tool? Okay, cool. So uh, I want to start with uh, big thanks to the organizers. I think they've done an amazing job. They've treated the speakers very, very well. Their communication, the, the organization, the logistics, everything has gone off perfectly. So I really wanted to thank them a lot. Um, they're almost doing the reputation of New York a disservice <laughs> by being so good and so polite. So thank you all very much. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, it'll give you some more background uh, about how I came to, to do this talk. I'm the founder of Cobenian, a uh, really large two-person company. Uh, we're a software consultancy. Um, we have some expertise in managed DNS and the backbone of the internet, your everyday stuff. Uh, I'm also uh, the creator and, and an instructor at the uh, Elixir Mastery class. We've had three classes so far. We'll have our uh, fourth in the fall. We'll be moving from DC to Northern Virginia. Um, and then finally, I'm the organizer of the Northern Virginia Elixir Meetup. Uh, we have 168 members, and I promise not more than 160 of them are bots. So <laughs> uh, we've, we've been around for over a year, so we have pretty good attendance um, and uh, a good sponsor who's given us a great location. Uh, so this talk, uh, as a small consultancy, this talk really came uh, about how do we leverage our experience as we go from client to client, project to project. Um, and so if you guessed code generation, you're not asleep, um, right? That's what the talk's all about. So uh, this is going to be focused a lot uh, on using code generation specifically for productivity because at the end of the day, that's what we care about. And when we use code generation, we can get more stable code. Uh, we can do things faster. We can have lower bids. Um, you know, it all gets passed on, happy customers, blah, blah, blah. Um, so <laughs> what, what uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes about code generation uh, is this one, and I'll just let you read it. Has, has anyone seen this quote before? Anyone know Alex by any chance? I have no idea who he is. Uh, <laughs> but I, I sort of have this caveat right up front, right? Code generation is not a panacea, um, but it is a nice tool to have in your tool belt. So we're going to go over four different techniques for generating code. Uh, they're going to start off with the simplest and get a little bit more complicated. And I'm going to try to go over the pros and cons of, of which each, uh, what each type of code generation is good for. So we're going to start off with the uh, simplest based, uh, uh, template based code generation, which probably everyone intuitively understands. Uh, there's some common pattern, right? We're going to capture the commonality in a template. We're going to pass in a few inputs, and we're going to have some output. And in, in the case of Phoenix, for example, uh, you're probably very familiar with this, right? Uh, Phoenix.gen.html, JSON, right? Whatever uh, the different generators are. Uh, you just pass in a few inputs, and then boom, you get some outputs. And in the case of Phoenix, you're generating source code so that you can, uh, it's, it's meant to just be a starter. You can go enhance it, and you can go build on it from there. Um, but before we do that, who has written their own custom mixed tasks in the past? OK, wow, not very many hands. Uh, so I'm glad I put this in here. So here's a quick refresher. Uh, creating your own mixed tasks is extremely useful and is just about the easiest thing that you can do. Even though it takes up a whole slide, it's, it's not very hard. Um, you create two subfolders under lib, mix and tasks. And then you can put your module in there. Um, Inside your module, you just use mix.task. Then you can add two uh, attributes, one for short doc, one for module doc. The short doc is the one line description that shows up in mix help. And then module doc is if you do mix help, whatever your task is, it will give you the full documentation. And then finally, you have a function with arity1, right, which is the arguments, the, the values that were passed in the command line. That's how easy it is to create your own mixed tasks. I highly recommend it um, for just steps that you repeat all the time. And then the last bullet point is mixed tasks are just code, and they go in the lib directory. So you can add dependencies uh, uh, to share your mixed tasks across different projects. So if you have projects and you find that, geez, we're always doing these steps, put it in code, put it in the library, 
You can publish it to Hex or GitHub and pull it down as a dependency, and your mixed tasks are available to you on a new project. And if you want it to be for development only, right, you just scope it properly in your mix.exs. So let's take a, uh, a really quick look at that. Oops. So we have under our project, mixed tasks. Uh, and, and this is the first bit of code generation that we're going to look at. So you, you'll notice, um, right, of course, the, the file name, but we've in, uh, used our macro, mixed tasks, to get us the mixed behavior, our short documentation, our long documentation, and then we have our run function with an arity of one. So uh, this particular example um, isn't particularly interesting, uh, but it, it gets the point across. So what I've done is I have, rather than um, depend on a potentially spotty uh, Wi-Fi connection, I've checked in three files with some very advanced statistics in them that uh, <laughs> have the TOB index uh, numbers from GitHub and Stack Overflow that are obviously totally made up. Um, and then it, what I have is I want to generate uh, a service for each of these. So let's go ahead and, and look at how we can generate a different module for each one. Well, the first thing that I recommend doing when you're going to do code generation is to write the code. So the first thing I did is I, I you know, opened Adam, in this case, my text editor, go ahead and write the code, get it looking exactly like I want. Then, it's horribly complicated, I moved it into an EEX template, and the uh, few values that I want parameterized in my template are just simply EEX expressions, right? So uh, if the service name is uh, GitHub, right, it'll capitalize GitHub and it will create a module GitHub stats. Uh, stats, when you call stats, right, you can, Elixir's beautiful, isn't it? Look how readable this code is. Uh, you read in from the github.csv file in the lib data directory, uh, right, that arrays path to path.join, we read the file, we strip off any uh, beginning and trailing white space, we split it on lines, we get rid of the first line because it has header information, we go ahead and turn each line into a list of values, and then we go ahead and sort it by their popularity. Not particularly um, complicated code, but it's just a, I needed a code sample that did something, so this is what I chose. Uh, and then read values, uh, we'll get into the, the details of it in a moment. Um, but back here, inside my mixed task, I have some, uh, you probably want to do something slightly more sophisticated, but this is the bare bones example of, okay, I have some arguments. If you give me a, an empty list, right, you don't provide anything. In this case, I don't know what you want to generate, so you get the usage. If you give me the service name, it's going to go ahead and generate um, the, the module, the code for that service. And then uh, in one case, just to make things a little bit more interesting, in the Stack Overflow, uh, I should show the GitHub first. In GitHub, we have the language and then the number of repositories. But for Stack Overflow, I've just inverted them. So we have the number of questions and then the language. So there's this second optional flag um, that, that defaults to true, you can see here in this case. So uh, if you pass in name first, then uh, false, right? It will invert the order so that it knows when it reads from the fake CSV that the name is not first, it's second, and it will reverse the order. Uh, the usage also incredibly sophisticated here. Um, but uh, in the end, right, all we're doing is on line 41, we're doing an EEX eval file, right? And then you have to give it the context, so you give it the assigns, and then uh, passing in service name, and then name first. That file's interpolated, uh, but then um, I have it now in memory, and as in the, the, it's bound to the variable code. I want to go ahead and write that out, so I go ahead and write it out to the module directory, in this case lib generated, and it will generate the github.ex file, save the code there, voila, I'm done. So we can do that. Uh, you'll notice right now under lib, I have uh, the template, the data, and the mix commands, but I don't have a generated folder. So. 
Oops. So if we run mix gen stats GitHub, it will go ahead and generate it. And I followed a best practice here from Phoenix. <laughs> when you generate something, uh, print out a message about what you generated so that the people who are at the command line can see uh, what's been output. If we come back over to the editor, you'll notice that there's a generated folder and our generated modules here. And to give a flavor of what this looks like. We can run the stats and it just returns the sorted list of the statistics from Git, the supposed statistics from GitHub. So it's uh, not very exciting, honestly, uh, but it's an extremely useful technique, especially when you have patterns that repeat over and over and over again. So like anything, there's engineering trade-offs. There's some good, some bad. First of all, this is extremely good for rapid prototyping and starting quickly. Um, and I wonder if half the people in this room did the same thing that I did when I first started using Phoenix. I started using the generators and I thought, oh, these are pretty good. But I wish that they did this one extra thing. And I wish they did this slightly differently. So I you know, contact Chris McCord and I say, hey, your generators are pretty good. But I think that they should do this. And Chris is very polite, so he didn't roll his eyes. Uh, but he says, yeah, yeah, everyone contacts me and everyone wants them to do something slightly different. The generators in Phoenix are just meant for education and they're just meant as a starting point to teach you about how to use Phoenix. Um, so they're very good for that. On the flip side, one of the big cons is once you generated that code and you modify it, you can no longer regenerate without losing your modifications. Right, hopefully that becomes pretty obvious this to everyone, but you, you've generated source code, you tweak it, you add some new functions to it. Well, if you regenerate, you lose your changes. Uh, there's some techniques to deal with that, um, but it's, it's a pretty big downfall. There are times when we want to be able to regenerate. Uh, maybe the patterns change slightly and we had already generated 50 things and we said, oh, you know, uh, we have a better way to deal with error handling now. Well, you can't go back and just regenerate all 50. You've got to go back and hand edit them all. So that's where technique number two comes in. Technique number two is cogeneration based on data models. And there's a whole bunch of different buzzwords around this. Um, but essentially, instead of generating code based on a template, we're going to generate code based on a data model. And we'll use the model to capture the specific data. So it's a very declarative um, form. So let's flip over. Oops, yeah, data model. And in this case, I've highlighted down here my, my data model, um, which is in effect all the data that I need to go ahead and generate three totally separate services. Uh, before, I would have had to have run the mix command three times, once for GitHub, once for TOB, and once for Stack Overflow. Now I can capture all of the information in one place in my model. It's descriptive, it's declarative, it, it says here's everything that I need to generate. And if something changes, uh, say for example, the stack overflow format changes, right? I can come back, change my data model, regenerate all the code, and life is good. So um, let's go ahead and look at uh, what this code looks like. This code looks, rather than just using EEX to do template replacement, this code's um, uh, uses the same thing, uh, but does it in a slightly different way. So you'll see the first thing that's happening is uh, on line 10, we are uh, just reading in from the config file, cogen data, and then getting the services out. And then we go ahead and it's just a list of services, so we just map our generate service function over that list of services. And as we generate each service, 
um, we go ahead and we convert um, the uh, atoms to strings just because that's binaries are expected. We go ahead and we pass it through. And then gen stats is still template-based uh, code generation in this particular case. It's just that we've used a data model instead of flags on the command line to, to drive our generation. So the data models, um, it's different. It's arguably a little bit more flexible because it's easier to regenerate the code over and over and over again. But it's still fundamentally the same thing. So the trade-offs with doing a model-based uh, model data generation uh, or code generation is, um, right, the, the benefit is that you can regenerate it. It's declarative. Those are fantastic things. Uh, you still have the same problem that once you generated the code or modified the generated code, if you regenerate, you lose those changes. All right, so you can do some tricks. You can pass in um, effectively callbacks right, in your uh, data model, and it works a little bit better. Uh, it, it, and you can do tricks like what C Sharp does, where C Sharp, when it compiles, you can actually have your source code in separate files, and it has the one that's compiled and then one that has your manually created source. And at compile time, the two get pushed together. Well, using behaviors and protocols, we can do similar things with Elixir. Um, and it works pretty well. Uh, and, and just as a, a point, these, these are not mutually exclusive, right? You saw that I had a whole section of the same code in the second example that was in the first example. And the same will be true for the third and fourth. Code generation techniques are not standalone. They can be used together. So the third technique. Uh, is macros. Who's written their own macro in Elixir? OK. Um, the important thing to remember about macros is that they are code transformations. And they happen at compile time. We've sort of seen a little bit of this um, earlier today. But uh, at compile time, the, the AST is handed to your function. It transforms the AST and hands the new AST back. And then the macro expansion happens one step at a time until all of the macros are expanded, and there's only AST left with no macros. So let's jump back into the code. It's much more interesting. Oops. So uh, in this case, I'll show the generated code first. Uh, it's a little bit shorter than what we generated before because I've used the uh, using macro. And if you're not familiar with it, whenever you do use, uh, it's the same thing as if you require a macro and then call the macro by name specifically. It only it follows a convention where the macro name is underscore, underscore, using, underscore, underscore. So when you do that, it allows you, it's a really convenient way to include functions uh, from a macro into another file. And you've seen this, you'll see this pattern used in Phoenix all over the place. But th the same thing happens here. So we can just define, um, you know, this module GitHub, and then we just use CoGen, and we give it the little bit of data that it needs, which is just the atom GitHub in this case, so it knows which CSV file to read in from, and we're done. We're off and running. We've, we've generated all of the code that we need. Uh, and the meat of this right, is just simply quoting the functions that we want included. And rather than using an EEX expression, we just go ahead and unquote the actual values that we want. And for anyone who's not familiar um, with what quote does, I think someone showed this earlier, but uh, you can take any Elixir expression and quote it, and it will show you um, what the data structure representation of that code is. So it's a, a very handy uh, function to use. And it's, it's almost always used in macros. So we still have the exact same code um, that we did before. There's, there's nothing different about it. And I, I was trying to keep the same consistent code example so you could just see the different techniques using the template, uh, using the data model, and now we've gone ahead and just put it into a macro. Um, in the end, 
exact same code. So let's come back over to the slides for a second. Macros have a little bit different set of trade-offs. First, they're built into the language. Um, they're easy to test. Because they are just data transformation functions, that means that uh, testing them is really simple. Just you, They're pure functions, right? You have some data, you pass it in, it gives you some data back. It's very easy to assert that the data that you got back is what you expected. Macros, of course, enable lazy evaluation. Um, something that just doing normal code generation uh, didn't give us. And finally, uh, they can help keep your code dry. So in both the first two cases, we had an explosion of code, right? So when it comes time to debug, we've just generated 50 different files with exactly the same patterns over and over and over again, uh, versus a macro where you have that code in one place in the macro that will be generated. So when it comes time to make a change to it, there's one place to go to, not 50, uh, especially if you've gone and modified the code so that you would have to regenerate it again. Uh, one of the cons of using macros for code generation um, is that because they are completely expanded at compile time, they don't exist at runtime. So if you need truly dynamic behavior, macros aren't an option. They're, they don't exist. You've already expanded the code out um, during compilation. The fourth technique uh, is probably the most interesting one and probably what most of you thought about when you saw a talk titled uh, Code Generation, and it's actual dynamic uh, compilation. So this is generating code at runtime based on runtime data, uh, loading up that generated code and executing it. So this has sort of been the vision of AI, vision of you know, Lisp for the past 50 years, saying, oh, we have S expressions. S expressions can generate new S expressions. We can evaluate them, which in turn right, generate new, yet more S expressions and evaluate them. And it's going to be a panacea, and the machines will take over. Um, so let's go look at uh, technique four really quick. So this is probably the most interesting. It, you've probably seen the first three. Uh, this one, maybe you haven't seen um, some of these modules in Elixir before. Uh, in this case, we have a generate service uh, function, right? And then we have one that takes no options and calls one that has options. Uh, and then there's a version that just converts atoms to, to strings, so it's not particularly interesting. But eventually, we get down to um, the interesting part. So uh, essentially, I take the service name, I go ahead and get the code for it, then I compile it, and then um, depending on whether or not an option's passed in, we can actually save that code out to a beam file if we want to take a look at the beam file, perhaps for debugging or something. But it's actually not necessary to save it off to a file to run it. Once the module's compiled, it's in memory, and it's available for you to, to execute. So. Um, let's look at what Code 4 does. Uh, the first thing that we do is we take the service name GitHub or TOB, we capitalize it, uh, and then we prefix it with Elixir dot. Does everyone understand why we do that? Does anyone know? So when uh, your Elixir code is compiled, that you have a module named Foo, the Elixir compiler always prefix prefixes it with Elixir dot. And it's transparent to you unless if you go look at the Erlang code or if you look at, at Beam. But if you want to call Elixir code from Erlang, you need to, to know that the Elixir code is always prefixed with Elixir dot. Um, so in this case, um, I'm going to take that, that GitHub service, and I'm going to create a uh, module Elixir dot GitHub instead of just GitHub. Uh, then for the uh, service name, uh, I'm just going to downcase GitHub. So it's case insensitive, whatever was passed in. Uh, again, I have uh, a macro here, so uh, I'm going to quote it. Uh, and then I'm going to define a whole entire module. Before, I just, in my macro example, I just had the functions that I wanted included, because I was going to be using that inside of another module. In this case, I actually want to produce an entire module. So 
inside of my quote, I have def module, and then the module name, and then I have my functions with just a couple places where the dynamic pieces of, of information are plugged in. So um, that will get us back the quoted code that I want for the module. Once we have the quoted code, um, there is a code module in Elixir standard library, and it has a few different forms, uh, or a few different functions for compiling code. So if I have it, since I've returned quoted code, all I have to do is compile quoted, and that will give me back the, uh, the actual code um, that, was, that um, was compiled and was loaded. So at that point, once I, once I call that simple line there, I've just dynamically introduced a new module at runtime based on runtime data into my running system, and it is available for me to use uh, programmatically. So I can do things, um, right, if I was to call down here, for example, github.stats, I would get a runtime exception, but if I ran it after the, uh, the code generation, then that would actually work because in the course of calling the generate services function, the GitHub module was created and was loaded, compiled and loaded into my running system. So it's available for me, and that second one, second instance would work. Um, and there are other modules, uh, or excuse me, other functions in code. Um, Right, you, you don't have to deal with quoted. You can also deal with strings as well. So you can just, I, I, I don't recommend it, right? It's like introducing a form of uh, in, an injection attack, <laughs> depending on which inputs, right? So instead of SQL injection, you can have Elixir injection. It's gonna be a new thing. <laughs> it's gonna be great. Uh, <laughs> uh, so so be, be a little careful, it's, it's already, kind of dicey, right, uh, compiling code on the fly, accepting any sort of input. But uh, a compile string, obviously, be especially careful of. And in addition to compile, there are also, um, off the screen, there are also some um, eval file, eval quoted, and eval strings. Uh, so if, if you're not familiar with the code module, I feel like it's one of the modules in the Elixir standard library that most developers don't ever get around to looking at. Um, they're, they're all, uh, there's not everything that you would want there, but the things that are there are very convenient. Um, so if you go look at the source code, you can in general figure out which modules in Erlang are actually doing the heavy lifting here. Um, the, the Sherpas, I guess to use Bruce's analogy from this morning. Um, and so the, uh, uh, it, going into that source code, is, uh, it's a really good thing to look at and to become familiar with. So let's go ahead and, and uh, run this one. Make sure I haven't made any changes. What did I call this? Oh, I guess to prove my point, Right, it's, it's not defined, but if I go in and do code gen, generate service, and I think that the arity of this right was, I wanna generate GitHub, ah, just return okay. Now if I go up in my history and rerun, right, I've dynamically introduced an entire module, um, wrote, loaded it and run it. So. Uh, it's not a lot of code. It's actually not complicated at all. It seems embarrassingly simple, but it's just something that most people aren't aware of and don't use. So I thought it would be something that everyone would find interesting. So um, now's my little side track. <laughs> uh, who has watched the announcement of Viv video? Uh, has anyone seen this video? Uh, it was on a couple of people, okay. So uh, Viv is a, uh, a new product that's going to be coming out, it's been announced. It's by the same people who did Siri, uh, and I believe sold Siri to Apple, waited 12 months until their non-compete ended, and then went around and created a new Siri called Viv that's a better Siri. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but realistically, uh, I think it's a very interesting idea. So what they've done is 
they've improved the uh, voice parsing quite a bit. Uh, and they're not, they're not going to be tied to a specific platform. So it's not going to be like Siri, uh, Microsoft has a voice service, Amazon has a voice service, Apple has a voice service. Their intent is to be a single service in the cloud that they'll have voice enabled commands on any device and it will go through their platform. But what's interesting about the way Viv works is, okay, so it's a better Siri. That's interesting, but not all that interesting. But the demo is kind of impressive because what they do is, they show, he uh, speaks a command, and it shows sort of uh, an AST of the parsing of the English words into uh, um, a, a tree, uh, and they have much better parsing. So he uses the example of like, I wanna buy a plane ticket to Phoenix two weeks from Friday, right? So rather than say the exact date and the exact time, he just uses English two weeks from Friday, and it's smart enough to parse that and figure out. What's a little bit different about Viv is that once it's parsed that, that AST, it actually dyna uh, dynamically generates code for every command that it processes. So uh, it's gonna be an entire platform based on code generation. So when uh, different voice services register with Viv, they're gonna get a user interface and essentially they're gonna be defining the rules for what code is going to be generated and executed whenever their voice service is activated, and, and that's pretty cool. So I thought, why not do something sort of like that for a demo? So this is the part where I'm gonna tempt the demo gods in a major way. <laughs> so let's see how things go. Um, uh, I mentioned at the very beginning that um, I, I teach one of the instructors at the Elixir Mastery class, and in the last class, uh, Adam and I, uh, the, the other instructor, we were looking for some cool example. And uh, like the night before, I had the idea a month before and I said, I'm gonna code up this example. The night before class, I actually got around to doing it uh, and it worked, thank goodness. Um, so we, we introduced it in class and, and I'm gonna sort of show it off a little bit here. Uh, demo gods permitting, we'll see how this goes. So um, this, does anyone know what this is? Yeah, it's it's the, the from the it's the Amazon Echo family. I forget what it's called. It's called a dot or something. So let's see if uh, if we can get this to work. Alexa, ask the fountain to tell me about Python. Really, you like programming in Python? I always use Elixir myself. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's. <laughs> So I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead and not do any more demos on that. Uh, but I thought it'd be fun. I'm gonna get a little bit off topic. This is no longer directly code generated related, but because of the way Viv works, I thought it might be cool to show you how complicated the code is behind that. Um, so what happens uh, with these voice uh, devices, uh, Amazon's in particular, is when I, when I say something, it takes the command sends it off to Amazon's cloud where the voice is processed. And then I've registered something. You notice I said, ask the fountain. So I have a service called the fountain. Um, and whenever you ask the fountain, it will go ahead and ask a question. And then that's the, the, uh, the voice command gets parsed in their cloud and sent as an intent to my service. So my service receives at a, I just have an endpoint with HTTPS. Uh, it receives HTTP REST requests for these voice commands, and then it processes them and sends back a response. That response is sent to the device where it just reads back the text. So here is all of the code that it takes to make Alexa say something. So my endpoint, um, just to show that I'm not cheating, right? my endpoint is uh, it's a post to Alexa, and it just calls the Alexa function in my page controller. Uh, when it comes in, the first thing I do uh, you can tell I was in debugging mode, so I'm still just printing out the parameters to make sure that everything's okay, even though they're already printed out by uh, Phoenix itself. I process the request, I get the response, and then I return the response as JSON. Okay, well, uh, what's process request do? Well, process request um, handles, uh, handles a request using pattern matching. Pattern matching is unbelievably awesome. And I think we're all starting to take it for granted. Go back and use another programming language and uh, you will miss it sorely. 
So you see, when you get a request and the intent has the name of MPEX in the programming language that was passed in has whatever value, in this case, I'm gonna rip it out. I have a, a, an enum defined uh, within Amazon. So it has Java, C, Python, Ruby, Elixir, et cetera. Um, and then it just returns this message. Really, you like programming in, right? I forget what I said, Python. Uh, I always use Elixir myself. And then I right, take that string, which is gonna be the message I wanna return, and I just turn it into a JSON payload which has the version, the response, which is output speech. Um, there's two types of text. There's plain text and then there's a text with markup. Uh, I'm just returning the plain text. It's pretty good about adding certain amount of inflection and pauses so it sounds a little bit more natural. I haven't found that I really need to use the markup. Um, and the markup, when I went and read the RFC, scared me a little bit because you can control a lot of the things about the voice and the example they gave was like, use a small child. And I was like, uh, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> so, and I'm not sure that the device actually supports that anyway. So, um, but I mean, this is it. And then you, you have this flag, should I end the session or not? Which is for, uh, in this case we do, because it's just one offs. But if you wanna have a conversation with the user, you, you can just return false there, don't end the conversation, and that way you can maintain state in the conversation with the user. So if they say, hey, I asked you about uh, MPEX 2017, right, and then you can ask follow-up questions and you can have that state and you can keep track and have a conversation with the user and only end it when it's done. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but um, I mean, this is it. This is the code that it takes to, to make Alexa respond to requests. Um, and the fact that we have pattern matching makes it really, really easy to say, oh, well, when this intent with these parameters comes in, execute this code. When this other intent with these other parameters comes in, execute this other code. I, I think it is um, amazingly simple and amazingly elegant. So um, I, I, just, I just wanted to show this off. Uh, you can, uh, Viv is an entire business around this code plus the code generation that I showed uh, in the, f you know, the first four types of code generation, the fourth one specifically with dynamic code generation. Granted, there are things a little bit more sophisticated, okay, but you know, I'll take a billion dollars in funding too. Um, <laughs> so uh, dynamic, uh, compilation, while it is the most flexible probably of any of these, uh, like anything else, it has some drawbacks. So you have to think a little bit more about the runtime constraints. So imagine in the Viv case, you're handling millions of requests and you're di generally or dynamically generating code and then executing it and then maybe unloading the module, hopefully you're doing that, right? But you do need to be aware of what's happening to memory, what's happening to the, you know, the resources on the machine that I'm executing. And then debugging dynamically generated code is probably a little bit more difficult, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's not there. So I'm gonna sort of have, have one final thought. Uh, I've done uh, some voice processing with these sorts of devices for uh, some customers, um, very early works. And I've, I've come to this really quickly, come to this conclusion that uh, voice in the enterprise is coming soon. And it's not coming soon for the reason that I originally thought. Node.js allowed front end developers to get to the back end and feel like they're awesome. Voice controlled systems are gonna let back end developers totally skip the front end and feel like they're awesome. <laughs> right? <laughs> So one of my customers, when they realized we don't have to pay the designer, we don't have to spend all this time up front doing all this, we can just have a system that will access our legacy system that we didn't have to build this sophisticated interface into, this is gonna save us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes, please. Um, so th I think that this stuff is coming and it's coming to the enterprise soon. Um, I, it just, just sort of this thought that hit me recently that I wanted to share with everyone. Um, and then finally, um, I'm, I'm getting to the very end. This is sort of my last point, but these, these cogeneration techniques that I showed were the simple ones. There's also some very sophisticated things 
Um, if anyone's ever seen the examples of, uh, from Friedman and William Byrd and, and other folks uh, from Conran, Mini Conran, Micro Conran, they actually take a res the output of a program, say 15, and they say, let's generate all the programs that produce that output. So if you think about that for a minute, that's mind blowing, <laughs> right? Uh, but then when you combine that sort of program generation with a genetic algorithm that says, hey, let's generate lots of different forms of a program and measure the outputs and see which one's the most efficient, and let's use that one. So this type of code generation and then the machine learning that takes place with, on this code generation, um, it, it's coming. It's already happening at Google and other large places, but it's coming to our industry too. And it doesn't mean the end of handcrafted software. This is not like, oh, hey, all of us need to go out and find another job. <laughs> um, but I think it is going to, over the next 10 years, it is going to change um, some of the types of problems that we solve with software. Certain things will just say, oh, just don't pay a developer to do that. That would cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Let's just hand it over to the machines. And we'll let them figure it out. That code that they're going to generate will be offensive to us, that the machines will generate, because it's going to be crappy. It's going to be like handing it to an intern and being like, hey, write some code for us. <laughs> um, but not only will that code be crappy, but it will be, uh, eventually it will get more efficient as the machine learns over time. But it will also not be understandable by people. So it'll, be, it'll become so big and so complicated that it will be difficult for us to, to, we won't be able to look at it and understand it as developers and reason about it. And that's a, a little bit of a scary world to be in, <laughs> to uh, you know, have, uh, imagine the flight control system in your airplane and no developer on the planet understands how it works anymore. Yeah, we're heading there. <laughs> so with that cheery thought, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I need to wrap it up. So uh, thank you all very much. Thanks, Brian. I think we need to keep things moving. You'll yep. be around at the after party. You no, I'm going to actually. All right, we'll give you one question. <laughs> <laughs> so make it a good one. I gave you one question. Someone asked a question. Yes. Okay, yeah, so um, in, in the second, uh, the question was, uh, how expensive is the compilation and um, can the output be saved? So the, the second one's very easy. Yeah, you can persist that and then you can load um, the code later on via, via other means. That's no problem at all. Um, so as for the efficiency of it, it's, it's pretty efficient, but the, like uh, was mentioned earlier, the code loading can be a little bit more expensive. Um, if you are in a really, really um, time sensitive situation, then that may become a little bit of an issue for you. But like I mentioned, I work at a two-person company. So <laughs> we, we don't have, we don't work, we work on some critical internet infrastructure, but we don't work on systems that have uh, that sort of performance um, demand. So I, it hasn't been an issue for me in anything that we've done. Um, but that said, I'm sure that there is a, a boundary there somewhere where you could hit it where it would be too slow. Thanks a lot, Brian. Brian Weber, everyone. <laughs>